so I'll just launch into it straight off. Uh, see this uh, voter ID UID link, which is being proposed now, like we all know is not anything new. The idea has been forever that this will be, you know, everything will be linked with everything and the UID number will be, uh, should be found everywhere in every database. This was the original plan. This was the conception. So it, we should not be surprised that it's happening now. Uh, it's just that it's not a good idea. What is more recent is an admission, if I can call it that, by the uh, by Mr. Ramsey Vaksharma and AP Singh on behalf of the UIDAI when it was uh, started, speaking as you know, founding members of the UIDAI, they have said in and it's on YouTube now. They have uh, categorically stated that this UIDAI and the database that is created was not created by them thinking that it would be of use to the government, but that it would be used to create a digital economy. That is, it's, you know, it's there in the Aadhaar 2.0 uh, proceedings. It's on the session that they had on digital, uh, uh, digital what's it, commerce, digital, what do we call ourselves? A digital economy. So it's in that session. So the, it's kind of open now and there is no doubt at all about why this was created. This is very useful to know because it also tells us why exclusion, which has been caused by the UIDAI uh, and by the way that uh, database works, why exclusion has not been a problem. For and that, uh, you know, to create, to create a business infrastructure and, you know, in 2018, when the case was being argued in court, Mr. Nilakani wrote an article in the paper where he said, Listen, this is really not just an ID. It's, a, it's creating infrastructure. It's like creating a road. Anybody can use that road. And that's the purpose of this whole exercise. We got to, it'll boost the economy. So I think one of the, uh, you know, from the time that we started, that the project started, where they were saying that this has to do with uh, delivering services, that the poor need an ID, that the poor need to do whatever it is that, uh, uh, you know, they, they need they need to do whatever they can to be able to identify themselves to the state. Uh, and that that is the purpose for which this uh, whole project was started. From there to the admission now that it was never intended for the state. In fact, they use very interesting language where they say that the state is now hold, you know, is holding this captive, that they've, based, you know, that they've usurped this uh, system, which was never meant for them. And they are advising, Mr. Ramsey Vak Sharma and AP Singh are advising the UIDAI that it's time for them to stop being a regulator and for them to take it back and give it back to the digital economy. So that's something that I'm you know, stressing on because I think we need to be very clear that they are not, you know, if we listen, we can hear what's being said and, and you know, that will help advance our understanding too. The second thing is just a brief on what are, what are the what is this database with which the with which the voter want, uh, voter ID election commission wants to link itself. What kind of a database? Is this? So we know that it is a database that was started. Uh, I think uh, Devashish Basu says it very well in uh, in his piece for the uh, business standard which is titled Torture Under Transparent Taxation, because now you have income tax proving to be a huge problem because the uh, way in which that income tax uh, system has been, the you know digital system has been rolled out is proving to be a huge disaster. So while he is angsting about it, he writes a thorough testing before the launch and continuous debugging through feedback after the launch which are the cornerstones of any software development. Amazingly, a tech-savvy government which has Digital India as one of its missions didn't do this adequately. Remember, Aadhaar and Goods and Services tax were launched with the same attitude. No need to test or bother about feedback. So this is what that whole project is characterized by. That you launch it, you see how it goes, you see what works. There is a whole population that's waiting there to become uh, you know, become experimentally guinea pigs. And these are now known positions, so there is very little to debate on. What is interesting about this, though, is that uh, one of the persons who's been pushing for this is Mr. Qureshi, who's actually quite a liberal 
uh, kind of person with whom one can hold a conversation. But on the UID, uh, he seems to think that that's fine. In fact, in one of the interviews, he says, Nandan Ilikani came to my office and told me when I was there that it's a good idea. And we decided that we will link, link these two. We have seen that throughout this project, it is marketing of this idea rather than actually you know, figuring out what is happening, what this project is about. That's what has been characterized by. It's just marketing. So we find, I was actually intrigued when on 9th November, uh, year before last, when, when uh, Mr. Ramsey Vaksharma's book came out, uh, they had a discussion on it. And at the discussion in 2020, from October 31st, there was an, uh, there was a expose, I mean, they'd done, you know, one of the, uh, Abhishek had done a, uh, an investigative piece and then it, it carried on. I mean, from October 31st till, till well into December, uh, almost every day there would be an article about how minority scholarships had got siphoned off and how the UID was used for the siphoning off. And it just required three people, the principal of a school, uh, a business correspondent kind of person and one other, you know, the person who's operating the machine for them to be able to get together and siphon off a whole load of uh, monies that were meant for minority scholarships. And so this started on August, uh, October 31st and on 9th November of 2020, you have this uh, discussion on Mr. Ramsey Sharma's book and there are five, four bureaucrats who are sitting there and having this discussion and they seem completely oblivious that there is any problem at all. That UID has not, that it has produced any problem, that people are ha having difficulties with it, that corruption is actually being fostered through this. And that, you know, it's very important that the Indian, uh, Indian Express expose, they did not expose it as something that was happening in the government. They got information from activists in the field that this is happening and they did an investigation themselves. The system hasn't responded to this at all. So now they've referred it in 2020, they referred it to the CBI, they referred it to a whole host of people, nothing has happened. Two days ago, we found that there was a, uh, you know, uh, in Delhi, Delhi High Court, it's a case that was registered with the court in 2020 January. And in 2022 January, the court is telling them, because there were some 400 and odd people who accordingly, the charges that uh, a district magistrate had uh, taken all these, who is himself from Rajasthan, had taken in all these people from Rajasthan and enrolled them as having UI, uh, as having Delhi addresses so that they could apply for a job in the DTC. And somebody filed saying that, listen, it needed domicile. These people don't belong here. But it, it was a fraud that was committed. So there's a case that's been, that he wrote to the Delhi government. The Delhi government filed a case and it hasn't proceeded because the UIDA refuses to cooperate. So it's a, we're reading things like this every day. And it amazes me that you have whole bureaucracies which say, we have no idea about any of this. This is technology. This is fine. There is no problem. If there are problems here and there, we'll kind of sort it out. We'll figure out what we do. But we are not going to acknowledge the kind of problem that exists. This is the project. And this is the bureaucratic response to the project. We also recently saw, meaning like yesterday, uh, Money Life had out an article where they said that as a, you know, they'd written about an RTA that they filed, where they said that eight crore, eight crore updates every year is what the UIDAI says they manage. So it's just, uh, seven to eight crores. They don't give you the breakup they say, we don't know what the various breakups are. It could be for address, it could be for name, it could be for mobile phone, it could be for whatever, for biometrics. But there are eight crore updates that happen all the time. So this is what, which essentially means, and I'll just move from there to this thing called the TAGAP report, which I'm sure many of you have seen, where uh, the TAGAP report was given in 2011, January, and Mr. Nilakani was its chair. And they had said, you know, it was about all these revenue systems and how the revenue systems have to be, uh, you know, what's the best way to deal with them because you have to introduce technology. So TAGUP stood for Technology Advisory Group on Unique Projects. And in that, in, uh, in the uh, sixth, paragraph, sixth chapter in the report, they have a thing called, they talk about what they call a self-cleaning mechanism. 
And I'm just going to read two, three lines from that uh, for you. As the saying goes, this is about data quality. As the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. An IT system is only as good as the data it consumes. The system design should have a self-cleaning mechanism. For instance, the U, for example, the UIDAI proposes to authenticate the identity of a resident based on data they have provided during enrollment. The system is self-cleaning, and please listen to this a little carefully. The system is self-cleaning because it is in the resident's interest to ensure that the system has correct data in absence of which he cannot authenticate his own identity. So what they will, it is through incentives and it, it goes on further clean data can be ensured by standardization of processes, matching and verifying information and workflows, simple and well-defined open platforms, blah, blah, uh, and penalization for non-compliance. It is through incentives that data quality can be managed rather than micromanagement of stakeholders. So it's a fascinating thing where they say, if people need to be able to use, uh, you know, use, their, use their identity as reflected in the ID system, it is up to them to clean up their own data on the system. And this links up with why people have to keep going again and again and again to the UIDAI to clean, clean up their data. This is a self-cleaning. And this is what the election commission wants to depend upon. We know that the process by which the UIDAI created its database and the process by which the election commission, you know, constantly works at keeping a good database are completely different. And that the election commission takes on a responsibility and a role in the creation and continue you know, and upgradation of that database constantly, because that is its job. Its job is to make sure that people do have the right to vote. And that people should not be obstructed because they are told that you don't have an ID. That's also the reason why the election commission does not confine itself to only one ID being uh, a relevant ID and uh, something that you can use. It's not just the voter ID. There are a series of IDs which are government given IDs, which they say can also be used uh, as an ID for them to for, pe for people to go and vote. Now, by linking it up with the UID, they make the UID the basis for even the election ID, for the voter ID. So the absurdity of it kind of beats me. I can't understand why somebody who's worked so hard to create a proper uh, electoral role uh, will end up, you know, will say that, okay, we'll link it up and we will depend on a database that has been created without any process. You just have enrollers who can sit anywhere to have uh, common service centers, which sometimes shut down sometimes because they're all commercial spaces. And we have seen through the years, you know, starting, I think, from... Uh, Maybe one of the one of the early ones which hit the headlines was uh, uh, what do you call it? Dania getting uh, a voter ID, uh, not a voter. Sorry, getting enrolled on the UID. Then you had a person in Hyderabad who's supposed to have enrolled over eight hundred people as biometric exceptions, except that he couldn't have done it because he had already been thrown out of his job, so somebody else was using it. You have the Kanpur fraud where you found that they could also you know, they could put things in, they could take things out, they could create IDs. You have the Rajna Khera investigative report that was done. It goes on. It's like endless. And none of these get acknowledged. Finally, we have, however, this uh, Indian Express report has finally found its acknowledgement in a government document. And I think we need to know, we need to see what it is that they are saying this is the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, which very recently, uh, no, very about a year uh, and some ago, they have no, about a year ago they've said uh, they're talking about you know the minority scholarship scheme and how that got hijacked, and they say three central sector scholarship schemes, namely pre-metric, post-metric, and merit come means, are being implemented by the Ministry of Minority Affairs for six centrally notified minority communities. The committee, the committee are quite disturbed by cases reported about the alleged misappropriation of funds, funds going to fake students under these scholarship schemes for children belonging to underprivileged minorities in six states which are under investigation inquiry. In one state after inquiry, the fraud is stated to have happened due to passwords leaked by certain vested interests as well as other loopholes. Taking advantage of illiteracy, lack of awareness among parents and children of minorities 
is also exploited by such elements. While the ministry representatives have always been claiming that the system is fail safe due to all transactions verifications done online, a dedicated portal, cash transfer through DBT and similar measures, which are definitely the need of the hour, it is disconcerting for the committee to observe that such instances of corruption happen. However minuscule, this must have deprived the genuine beneficiaries of government scholarship schemes and may lead to some children dropping out uh, to being unable to afford the school fees, other expenses. During this evidence, the ministry representatives informed the committee about further safety measures. This is last year, okay? So this is 11 years after the project started. The ministry representatives informed the committee about further safety measures under their consideration. For instance, preserving the files of scholarship holder students for a period of five years, creation of an Aadhaar vault in coordination with Meiti, requirement of signatures of school principals in verification report filed by teacher, at least two person physical verification, creation of student data bank with the help of department. So the number of things that they have to do to remedy the problem that has been created by the UID is quite stunning. And we find that, you know, the, there is an, it, this report I found was fascinating also because there is nothing that they've received from the government. There is no investigation report. There's nothing reflected in this report. So what you find is that they are looking at, uh, you know, they, they are uh, looking at newspaper reports and say, it seems this has happened and it seems that has happened. Absolutely no input from the government, except saying, oh, we'll open other vaults after this. So, I mean, Election Commission, I think, needs to understand what kind of a system it is that they are dealing with. Now, we, you know, we, let's just look at two other uh, quick, uh, you know, two other reports quickly. You find that um, Mr. Rijiju had said that actually, uh, some standing committees had already okayed the linking of UID with uh, uh, voter ID. So why are people complaining now? Now, when you go and look at what is this place where they where they are supposed to have said, okay, you find that this is uh, report number 101 and report number 105 in 2020, in March and September uh, 2020, on the demand for grants. Now, in the 101 uh, report, they are talking about the election commission having launched that 2015 uh, purification authentication uh, program to weed out bogus voters by using unique ID Aadhaar number, which has to be which had to be suspended because of, of the Putaswami case. And then they go on to say the commission has approached the law ministry for appropriate legislative backup for which amendment to the representation of the People Act 1950 and the Aadhaar Act 2016 is necessary. By this process, there would be an in, this is significant too. By this process, there would be an intrusion to the privacy of the individual. But the objective of purifying electoral role will serve the public interest. That's it. No other explanation offered for why privacy should be given uh, a go by. And it's important, I think, here to just pause for a minute and see that you know privacy means different things in different places. The most significant thing in terms of privacy, I, I mean, at this point, I would think are two. One element or three, one element of uh, privacy is that you should, you, know, you should be able to reflect yourself as you are. And if that gets taken away, that is also a violation of privacy. So if I'm not able to say, if I go there, if I come to you and say I'm Usha and you say, no, you're not Usha at all, that's actually a violation of my privacy if I can't establish who I am. The other thing is that this is about the secret ballot. You know, I, I would have thought that you know, in all this consideration that they have, they say free and fair election, that it should be a secret ballot should be one of the most significant things. And the moment you link this up with the UID, and at this point, I'll, I mean, I'll just read the last line of this and move on to that. It, it, it says here, it was therefore pleaded that the purported invasion of privacy may be permitted for linking voter ID card with Aadhaar number. Now, these are not permissions that the government can give. These are constitutional protections. So here you have a threat to the secret ballot. And the third thing is that it's not, you know, the moment the voter ID is go going to tell the UID, UID AI, that this is the person who we are looking to authenticate, UID AI then has uh, that information. 
and that number the person you know who that, that number holder will find you know because because you have no choice today they have to put their number in various databases all of us know what is being done with us so they have to be in multiple databases and linking these i mean this idea of convergence uh, rahul mathan who otherwise supports the uh, project the only thing he concedes and this was also the first trial legal report was where he said that convergence of data can happen and that's something that should be watched against ap singh mr ap singh when he came to the delhi uh, delhi school um, of social work and when we had a discussion on this at that time he said the rest i'm not sure about but convergence it is true will definitely happen so we are talking about punishing people if they are not going to be voting the way you want it to be knowing about people in the first instance you know huge prop possibility of uh, manipulation because you know so much this the government knows so much about all of these people one question that could be asked is why do you th- say that the government would know the government knows nothing this is the uida and that is an independent agency but when we look at the aadhar act of 2016 we find that the government controls the uida the government under that law has the power to give directives to the uida and if the uidai does not follow its directives it can take it over for six months at a time so we are really talking about an extraordinary kind of thing in that law and the relationship so for the election commission to say that they will bank on something that is entirely controlled by the central government is a very strange uh, position in which we find ourselves i think it's also useful to look at other provisions of the aadhar act i'll mention only one more which is section 5 now if you look at section 5 if you look at section 5 it says special measures for issuance of aadhar number to certain category of persons the authority shall take special measures to issue aadhar numbers to women children senior citizens persons with disability unskilled and unorganized workers nomadic tribes or for such other persons who do not have any permanent dwelling house and such other categories of individuals as may be specified by regulations this provision was an indication of all those who the uh, uidai recognized even then are likely to have difficulty in getting enrolled and then you have a problem in 2019 they had to say okay if your biometrics don't work if you're not able to authenticate yourself then locally they should deal with it this is a system that has admitted that it doesn't know what is happening i'll refer to only one more document and then we can you know in we can come back to it later and uh, i'm forgetting what the document was i wanted to refer to it came to my head and moved out immediately but so let me move to the last thing that i want to say which is that the uidai and this again is said by mr ap singh at that uh, aadhar 2.0 meeting uh, where he says that the, the there was magic that was created by the project and that magic lay in three numbers and those three were jandan aadhar and mobile he said these three linked together can produce magic and he says we have already created the system which houses the magic now it's for the uidai to make sure that you have that this magic is actually realized which is basically to say that these three numbers put together will identify people in various ways which will allow for various businesses to be built on the personal data that, that can be acquired through these three numbers the uid uh, the election voter id does not require all this kind of information voter id requires that it's only about id and being and saying where you can go that's it so there are two arguments i mean two things that they say that one is deduplication and the other is about uh, migrants being able to work now on the duplication there is no evidence that they give you at all to say what is the extent of duplicates that they have noticed what is the difficulty that they have in the other systems that they have in place for them to be able to deal with the duplicates the duplication i mean if there are duplicates isn't there isn't the system that they are doing also producing some kind of result is there no other way by which you can do it because in the violation of a fundamental right one of the principles of proportionality is that you do not violate it you do, for instance the right to privacy you will not violate it uh, 
you know, you won't violate it unless you simply have to, and it will be to the minimum that you need. Here, they haven't even said what the extent of the problem is. And if they don't know the extent of the problem, then they have no, actually no right at all, no constitutional right to uh, use this. The second thing is when they talk about migrants. So actually, there is no evidence on deduplication. And I think we really, really need to uh, demand in, uh, some kind of information on this because the same thing happened with pan cards. They just said, and that was it. There was no need for them to establish uh, anything more. On migrants, they say that, uh, of course, Mr. Nilagani in a recent interview on his new book has said, oh, you know, the migrant, they go to the cities and then they are not able to vote there. They just have to go there and change their address and then they'll be able to go and vote you know, where they are staying there. So it's a very glib way of treating this. And uh, of course, the easiest thing, according to them, is that you can change the address at any time. So I'm not sure what kind of a protection that that provides to ensure that you're a voter. Maybe, you, I mean, I'll be a voter somewhere one month, somewhere else the next month, depending on where the elections are. So it's a very strange and skewed way of looking at this. But apart from that, if they decide that they are going to use biometrics as part of their authentication uh, mechanism, then two things to remember. One, in 2019, when they started talking about One Nation, One Ration, letters were sent around, there was, which were circulated. I have a copy of the Tripura letter, where they say that there are a series of people. So they say, you know, people above 60, people below 15, people who are disabled, people who can't move, various kinds of uh, if there is only a one member family, then you find that, you know, they may not be able to authenticate themselves with the fingerprint. So they can actually establish, you know, they can uh, nominate a person who will then give their biometrics on behalf of the person themselves. It's a, it, this is another very strange kind of thing where I, my identity will be determined on the basis of somebody else's biometrics. Now, this ought not to surprise us because in, uh, when questions started getting asked and they were the UIDA found itself in a tight corner uh, in 2014-15 up to, you know, uh, up, you know from 2015-16, from the time of the August 11th order till the uh, law got passed, they said that they were setting up something called the UBCC, which is... Um, UIDAI Biometric Center of Competence. And the logic for that was that the nature and diversity of India's working population makes biometrics a challenge. And then we thought, okay, maybe they set something up, maybe they got some kind of, uh, you know, maybe some report, something. We actually found when we ferreted that not a single penny, not a single rupee, not a single paisa had been spent uh, on setting this up. So it was, on, you know, they recognized the problem. They knew they didn't want to be questioned. They want, needed an answer if they were questioned. And at the end of it, when nothing happened, they, were, they passed a law where they said, we will share everything other than biometrics. So the biometric database, as is the demographic database, these are completely unaudited systems. And these are known to be full of errors. This is the database with which the voter, uh, with which the election commission wants to link the voter ID. Just think about what that means. There is a whole lot else, but I, I just thought some of this, I'll set this up. Thanks, Padmini. Thank you, uh, Shaji. Um, so I had a question <laughs> with regards to what does one do in the face of this, right? Like, you know, much of the work that we're doing at One Vote is about making the citizen conscious of these developments and these you know, shortcomings and issues. But what can citizens actually do in terms of taking action in order to kind of push against these developments? Because we're seeing um, over the YouTube channel, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of faith in the EVM um, as because it's technology and people feel that, oh, as a technology, it will be exact and correct. Uh, and therefore, you know, not at fault. So how do we, you know, what kind of instruments can we use to kind of take action and maybe push against this? I think the kind of thing that we may need to do in relation to EVMs may be different from what we need to do in terms of the voter ID and UID link. For this reason, that uh, EVMs are something that people encounter only during an election. It's only those who are working on it who are aware of, you know, what kind of problems there could be. It, it's only someone who understands how software gets used uh, in these systems who will, you know, who will have questions about, who will know how to ask the questions about it. It's only someone who understands the nature of the source code who will be able to tell us, you know, what these issues are. So in the popular imagination, 
uh, how you question a technology of this nature. So, you know, is it's not that clear. It becomes a little clearer when we find that there are other countries in the world which have rejected it. Which countries you believe, you know, all of us commonly believe, believe in technology. So if they are saying no to it, then, you know, what are we missing? So that, that could be one kind of question. But on the voter ID, UID link, I find that actually people are just feeling pressured and pushed into a corner because, see, unlike the EVM, in the UID, everyone is being cornered into trying to work the system. I mean, if you look at yes, the JPAL, uh, if you look at the JPAL report, uh, you know, that Karthik Murli Dharan's report, you find that uh, they say that, you know, a large number of families are able to link their uh, UID with the PDS because at least one of their fingerprints work. So if there's a family of five and there's one person whose fingerprint works, they are saying, okay, at least we're able to link it. So it's a deeply defective system and people are experiencing it. I was actually very surprised at a recent meeting, uh, which I attended on digitization, where I found that every person coming from the different sectors, whether it is labor or it is banking or it is agriculture or whatever, all of the food, work, everybody, you know, they would say, for instance, on the social security code, that all uh, un, you know, un, uh, unemployed or unorganized workers, everyone has to put their get onto that database. So they say, okay, you get onto the database. To that, to do that, you have to give your UID. Then they want your bank account uh, number. Then they want your PAN. Then they want you to keep reporting to them about where you are. And all this has to be done through technology. And at the end of this, and throughout. From 2010 till now, they have, you know, there has been no hiding. Even the UIDA hasn't hidden, hidden this. That, uh, you know, fingerprints are a problem for migrant workers. Iris can be a problem. You know, biometrics are a problem for migrant workers. So, you know, this is slightly different for that reason that there are so many, you know, people have just fallen off the map and nobody is even counting them anymore. People go to the ration shops every uh, month and find themselves in trouble. So I think, you know, with a, uh, it's helplessness and choicelessness that is pushing people to have to do this. They are not doing it because they expect the system to work. They just know that they will be excluded if they don't somehow try to include themselves. That's the cruelty of the system. But that also makes it easier for people to understand. Right, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a question uh, in the chat. Um, so uh, what is um, the unique aspect of India's rule of law that makes the creation of this kind of citizen database possible in a state of exception? See, I, I think uh, we need to apportion some of that responsibility among different agencies. I think one of the things is that uh, in the, okay, this is just my way of reading it, that uh, we, uh, it is correct that the state has a responsibility to make sure that everybody has what they need, not just to survive, but to be able to move on in life. Which means that if I'm in a PDS system today, you know, five years or 10 years down the line, I should not need to be in that PDS system. If I have been below poverty line for a certain period of time, I should have been able to move out of the, you know, out of, out of the poverty line. I'm not sure we are calculating, you know, we are looking at it like this. We are looking at trying to somehow make that system work, but we are not looking at what it will mean to get, so in my head, freedom from the state. And this does, not in the libertarian sense, but freedom from the state in terms of not having them oppress me with, you know, with UAPA or with uh, whether I'm a minority or not, or whether it's whatever, that is a very important freedom. And it's a freedom that we have lost in large measure because we have participated, we have allowed ourselves to lose this, which means that, you know, people will often ask, uh, have you all, you know, have you got yourself a mobile phone? And I say, you know, they'll say, but how will you operate without it? I'm, I'm like, where is the problem? Is the problem that I don't have a mobile phone or is it a problem that the system will not allow anyone to operate without. And do you know the number of people in this country who don't have mobile phones? And if they're going to be maintaining that, the artifact becomes more in, important than their own, than what they need to get on in life. Isn't there a problem there? 
So I think in our, uh, there is a way, it's a, I keep saying this, but you know, it's a strange thing that in this country, which taught the world non-cooperation, we are the most obedient that you can find, which is why when people say we need systems like this so that, you know, there won't be anarchy, I can only laugh. Where is the anarchy? We are just much too obedient. It is, a, I mean, that is a problem. I don't even mean it, but, you know. I mean, there's a certain levity, of course, in that, but it is meant in seriousness too. Because if something is wrong, it's wrong. You know, when Gandhi refused to follow the sedition, uh, you know, he said, the sedition law is bad. What I'm doing is not bad. The sedition law, so I can't obey. If I obey it, then I'm obeying something that I know is bad. How can I do that? 